Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I've already mentioned, um, my work was done within the context of the research of NICER, and it was done within the context of the faith, faith in the Nexus research. And before I talk in more detail about my work, I just like to recall some of the basic facts of the Nexus research. So the faith in the Nexus research looked at how church primary schools facilitate the opportunities for children to explore faith and spiritual life in the home. And in the research involved were 20 church primary schools across England. The method used was the mixed methods research, including qualitative and quantitative studies. And the qualitative research uh, included inter individual interviews with head teachers, as well as focus group interviews. And the quantitative research consisted of an online survey with about 1,000 participants. Yeah, so this is the overall context of my research. And as I've already mentioned briefly, um, I I was or I am a research intern at NICER and within the context of the wider research I looked at the spiritual leadership of church primary head school uh, church primary school head teachers and in my in my uh, research uh, I did an analysis of 13 head teacher interviews and so the head Within the head teacher interviews, the head teachers were asked, for example, what happens in the school that facilitates the children's exploration of faith in the home? So, um, as you can see from those questions or from this question, um, the head teachers weren't directly asked about their style of leadership or how they lead the church schools. Um, because in this way, um, the research could gain a broader picture and a wider view of what head church school head teachers um, perceive as important that is happening with regard to children's exploration of faith or what happens in school that enables this. Yes, so um, as I've already said, um, I analysed the 13 head teacher interviews and I coded them through Envivo. I think the software is probably familiar for most of you. And through this, I identified common themes. Um, so the questions that were analysing, uh, that were underlying this analysis was, first of all, how do head teachers perceive and portray their and their school's role in facilitating children's exploration of faith? Furthermore, um, we, wa we wanted to find out, or I wanted to find out, how head teachers portray their and their school's relationship with the faith community, so to see in which religious setting they're embedded. And last but not least, an important thing I wanted to look at was in which language head teachers um, express their vision for a school culture that fosters growth and a school culture that fosters spiritual growth. The reason uh, why I put such a strong emphasis, emphasis on language is also due to the fact that in the in the head teacher interviews, of course, we I didn't have direct access to what was happening in the schools, but I did have direct access to the language that the head teachers used. Yes, so, and in my, um, in my, or oh, before my analysis of the, of the head teacher interviews, I also did a literature review and looked at the literature regarding similar research that has been done. And one particular useful study that I came across um, was from Alan Shaw. And into now my PowerPoint is stuck somehow. So in 2015, Alan Shaw published his thesis in which he looked at the leadership of voluntary aided schools. And Shaw's aim was to study or investigate the perceptions of head teachers of voluntary 
aided schools regarding their leadership roles, responsibilities and challenges. Um, in his research, he looked at Jewish and Christian head uh, schools, church schools, or faith schools at that. And his study or his re research showed um, that there is what he calls an enhanced form of leadership common to head teachers of voluntary added schools. And she termed this um, common form of leadership leadership, authentic leadership. Um, his focus on authentic leadership, um, or with this focus on authentic leadership, he aimed to show that there's a significant role, or yeah, or he pointed to the, and here I quote again, to the significant role of the special efforts which envelops the head teachers of these schools as a result of the efforts together with those of the eight eight stakeholder groups with whom they interact. So um, to make it a bit more easier for you to follow, um, I have depicted the I've depicted the the model here as well. Um, as is already mentioned, um, Alan Shaw identified the important role of the ethos and the head teacher who is in the center of the study and of the model of authentic leadership operates on the basis of an ethos that determines his work and what he does or what he or she does. And his daily work is also or is carried out in relationship with various stakeholders with whom he or she interacts. These are, for example, the diocese, the local authorities, school governors, as well as the local faith community, parents, pupils, the staff who's also working in the church school and the department for education. This already shows that the head teacher isn't operating on itself and but is in or is connected within a network of relationships. And now with Kind of this uh, theoretical background, I would like to come back to my research and to to um, to talk to you about some of the findings um, that I made with the research or by analyzing the interviews. So, um, concerning the question of what happens in schools that facilitates children's exploration of faith in the home. Um, some um, some recurring themes appeared, and these recurring themes are the importance, first of all, of um, or not first of all, but the first and most visible sign um, is the physical presence and visibility of faith or religious symbols in the school building itself. These were, for example, Bible quotes that could be found on the wall or um, entrance hall that depicted motives from the Bible or religious symbols. This was one, one aspect that was mentioned repeatedly. Um, furthermore, head teachers stressed the importance of collective worship, as well as the importance of prayer and reflection. And worship as well as prayer and reflection um, happen um, repeatedly throughout the week or throughout the day in the church schools. Um, head teachers as well mentioned that it is very important for them to be welcoming and inviting, either inviting the children's uh, or pupils, parents and families, but also inviting the local church community. This ties in also with the next point, um, because um, the head teachers also mentioned the importance of the relationship with the local clergy, as well as with the local faith community. And finally, another important theme that appeared in the head teacher interviews was um, that the head teachers are very interested in in enabling children to explore the faith themselves. 
So this is an important aspect for them as well. Uh, at this point, do you have, I've talked a lot now already, um, do you have any questions already or any comments maybe? All right, but you can still hear me, right? Thank you, Esther. Yes. I think that's really <laughs> okay. comprehensive. I'll just jump in there. I just um, thought, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in that list because obviously you've looked at the data in a different way to us. Uh, and the faith visible in the school building, have you put those in an order of, you know, which priority you think the mm -hmm. head teachers were um, talking about mm -hmm. them? Um, no, to be honest, um, this is not uh, in an order of importance. Um, the thing is why the visibility of the faith in the school building um, comes first is that it was often, or that it was noticeably by head teachers, it was, uh, it was mentioned at the very beginning of the interviews. Um, Thank you. As the one thing that becomes visible for people who go there. Um, on the other hand, one yeah, but I think I would say that one of the most important aspects would really be enabling the children to explore the faith themselves. And really, and this will come, this will come up again later, the focus on the children, the focus on the pupils really is probably the most important theme, which runs across all the head teacher interviews. Got a question from Caroline. Just... Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see your faces anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, re it's really interesting what you're saying. And, and like Anna, I was interested in the priorities. I'm also interested in um, where the ch where the head teachers got their ideas from. Um, did they have any particular models, or did they talk about you know what influenced them maybe in 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 doing these things at all? Mm -hmm. Um, some of them, so it wasn't it wasn't addressed systematically in the interviews, but um, it appeared again and again. Um, so this and here I'd like to come back about the style of the interviews. So the interviews were semi-structured interviews, uh, which means um, the head teachers were not asked systematically, where do you get your ideas from? But they were able to elaborate on what seemed important for them. And there it became clear that, for example, for some head teachers, the, the grounding in their faith and their faith community is very important. And this is a very important motivator for them. And on the other hand, other teachers or head teachers very specifically and empathetically um, stressed that they're doing it for, for the benefit of the children and they want to give the children good opportunities and and um, yeah um, provide a, provide a beneficial background for the children. So yeah. And um, does this answer your question or sorry, yeah, thank you. That was re that, that was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the motivations so behind leaders? are quite yes. exciting in our context we have quite difficult policy directives and frameworks mm -hmm. so yeah. it's actually is driving them to do what they do it is quite True. fascinating mm -hmm. yeah um i'll pick up again on that later as well so we'll we'll come back to that in a kind of roundabout way as well <laughs> thank you so um, yeah, as I've already mentioned now, um, that there are several um, there are several recurring themes in the head teacher interviews, but it became also very apparent um, when analysing the interviews that there is considerable considerable variation between the various church schools. So there's really quite a broad range in how head school teachers um, perceive their schools and their own leadership as well. Um, first of all, there's um, the church schools um, which took part in the survey had different socio socioeconomic background. Um, this became apparent also in the head teacher interviews. And um, there was also a great variation um, concerning the relationship with the local church community, because some churches 
were in an area where there was a local church community and local clergy with whom they interacted, there was a close relationship, whereas in other head teacher interviews, the local church community wasn't mentioned at all. So this was quite interesting to see that as well. And um, the church schools also belonged to uh, different denominations. Um, some of them were Church of England, whereas others were, were Catholic schools. Um, what became or oh, what was very interesting is also that um, the Catholic schools, for example, all had faith-based admission, whereas the Church of England schools, they varied in their admission policy. Another, um, another thing that became very important is that the church school had teachers of the Catholic schools um, in the language they used, um, used very specifically religious um, language, whereas this was not as noticeable or in the Church of England schools, or at least there was a greater variety in the Church of England schools. And the language used by head teachers is now um, the topic I'd like to elaborate more on, because it was one of the main things I looked at. So, um, by looking at the head teacher interviews, um, I noticed very quickly that there is quite a, a huge variety, and um, in and in the language the head teachers used. So, um, some head teachers used in what I termed overtly religious language, whereas others used more secular language. And in order to understand what I mean with this, I would like to illustrate this with some examples. So, um, for example, um, the head teacher of School One talked about what the Catholic school is about, and um, and the head teacher said, "I think the Catholic school is here to bring the message of our faith to the children and to the families, and to find ways to make that vibrant and alive and real." So this quote already shows quite an, a conscious sense of mission, that it's important that, the, that one of the aims of the church schools is to promote the faith, as it were. On the other hand, for example, the head teacher of School 16 said, well, on a personal level, I think that you can be very be a very spiritual person without being religious. I'm very, very keen that our children are given the information to make their own choice about it. We do not, we do not, as long as I'm in this school, we will not push Christianity down anyone's throat. We do not insist on prayers, we insist on silence. And you know that being still and being quiet while other people pray but we will never force children to pray. So there's also quite a noticeable difference. And with this, I do not mean that the Catholic school will force Christianity on, on pupils, of course not. But um, it just shows that the, for the head teacher in school 16, it's much more important to stress that, um, that, there's, that the language and the school is inclusive and that it's not forcing Christianity on anyone. Um, this difference also um, became very apparent when head teachers talked about prayer. For example, in school one again, um, the head teacher mentioned, we do pray, we pray a lot, we have a lot of prayer activity going on, which is some of it optional and some of it given. So here again, um, the very conscious use of religious vocabulary and the mentioning of prayer. And on the other hand, in school four, for example, um, the head teacher, when asked about what is happening in the school regarding faith and spiritual life, um, it is meant, um, yeah, it is said, I think it probably is the reflection areas and the garden that has the strongest influence on them developing their spirituality and supporting their reflection. So there was quite a noticeable difference between the use and the focus on prayer and on the other hand, the focus on reflection. 
and in a way those terms or what is done in the school is almost well not interchangeably of course because there's a different rationale behind it but um, some of the schools focused and were talking about prayer whereas the others were talking about reflection and this was, was quite interesting to see as well and then again um, here um, language that is if you want to say probably not overtly religious but more focusing on an inclusive language so um, the head teacher from school six said if we do anything we do it because it's good for our children so and maybe this ties back in with the question from before why do head teachers do what they do they do it because it's good for for their children this is the strong motivator that unites them so to say so again if we do anything we do it because it's good for our children um, the christian values that we follow everything about the archbishop religious award fits within that yeah and we're very explicit about what those values are and it's not exclusive to christians values and what we work at work hard at is making sure the links that are made to the faith so to be truly inclusive so the head teacher for the head teacher of school six it's not that important to stress the uniqueness of the christian school and to stress the christian identity but it's important to make it inclusive and to focus on values and values that are good for the children um, and the same holds true for the head teacher of school 17 who said it's the ethos the language that is lived through and through the parents have noticed the difference at home i will not accept anything less than what these children deserve i won't and if you don't like it go and work for somebody else who shares your values so this school 17 was also quite interesting um, it was a school from a rather low or weak socioeconomic background but what the head teacher made very clear was that she did everything for the children and that she was fighting for the children's um, welfare and for the children to have opportunities so, to sum it up, um, as I've said, there was considerable variation between the various shared schools concerning the socioeconomic background, relationship with the local church community, the de denomination, and very importantly, also regarding the language used. And I would argue that one can identify two basic strategies here. And these two basic strategies are emphasizing the Christian or sometimes Catholic identity and I'm not saying the Catholic isn't Christian but what was noticeable is that the head teachers of the Catholic schools didn't employ the term Christian but used the term Catholic specifically so um, as I said there are these two basic strategies and one is emphasizing the Christian identity of the school and the other one was emphasizing inclusivity and this came together with using language that is not necessarily specifically christian but language that is more um more secular talking about values for example ethos talking about reflection and not talking about prayer for example um yeah so there are these two basic strategies but underlying these two basic strategies which i'd say and um, there is one common ground and this common ground is doing it for the children and regardless of whether the head teachers port portrayed their motivation with religious language and like uh, using the faith community as the ground for the work they're doing or whether they use more secular language they all made it very clear that what they're doing and what the children, uh, what the school is doing, um, the reason for this is to provide good opportunities for the children. 
And here I would like to come back to Shaw's model of authentic leadership. So in Shaw's, what Alan Shaw pointed out in his research was that the head teachers of the voluntary edit schools all portrayed or all displayed a very strong sense of ethos. So they all displayed a pervading ethos uh, of an ethos that pervaded their work, their daily work and how they were leading their schools. And they do so in interaction with um, various stakeholders. What I think does not become as clear in Shaw's model as it could be is that the pupils are the central and common theme that determine what, that determine what the head teachers do. So the orientation at the pupils' welfare is really what drives and what is the common denominator for all the head teachers interviewed. At least it was in the research I've done. Yes, so and with this, um, I also come to the end of my presentation. Um, as I've said, there are some common themes that emerged through the analysis of the interviews, of the head teacher interviews, and also the analysis showed great variation between the various charter schools. But in the end, it all came back to a common denominator, and this was that the head teachers all operate on a very strong ethos, and this ethos is oriented on the pupils' welfare. Yes, so um, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and if there are any more comments or questions, please come in.